Welcome to the Hunting Beast Podcast, your source for hunting tactics, news, and stories. And now your host, Mario Traficante. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this week's edition of the Hunting Beast Podcast. Wanted to try something a little different this week. Uh, we requested to the Beast members if they had any questions that they'd like Dan or I to answer. And uh, the forum responded. We have about 42 questions to go through and, and answer, and there's a lot of good subject matter here. So Dan and I thought we would do this in a video format. Um, we'll make an audio copy of it as well, but that way we can draw some pictures and do some different stuff on here. So, Dan, how's it going? Just waking up. Just waking up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what are we at? June. Yeah. It's you nice. know what amazes me? I've been to your house how many times? Like a half dozen times? I still can't find this place. You know, it's like two turns. It is two turns. Also. You know, but the trouble is you live in a subdivision. If you lived in an oak tree two miles back in a swamp, I'd be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have any reference points like turn at the big oak tree and then right. go through the nasty red brush thicket and you'll find the house. But... Cool. So, yeah, it's plenty warm here. It's about, it's been 85, 90 degrees the last five days, so. It's not bad um, down here in the cave. Yeah, it's it's good down here in the basement. It's nice and cool. So, all right. Well, there's no particular order to these, so we're just going to take them as they came on the site. So, first question on the list. Um, it was actually for me. It says, Mario, do you hunt with a crossbow? And if so, how have you modified your setups to account for the crossbow? When do you load? Have you found it difficult to stay stealthy, etc.? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I've been hunting with a crossbow probably for the better part of almost 17 years now. Um, and... I really haven't modified my setups at all to account for the fact that I have a crossbow. Um, have I changed my hunting practices and how I set up over the last 17 years? I would say for sure, but it has less to do with hunting with a crossbow and more just to do with what I've learned and, and how I, I changed uh, my patterns and what I do. Um, one thing with the crossbow, you do have some limitations as far as how you can turn and shoot in a tree. You have to account for the fact that you, you are shooting with a horizontal bow, which you know typically has a wider footprint horizontally. So when you're swinging and rotating shots that are around behind you um, or underneath you and things like that, it does make it a little bit more difficult because you don't have as much mobility in the stand. But there are obvious advantages uh, to it. I don't have to draw back on stand. Um, I can stay motionless and and shoot as the deer approaches. Um, the second part of this, when do you load? Um, going into my tree stand, you know, walking in, I, I rarely, it really depends on the time of the year, but I rarely load and cock the, the or I, I don't put an arrow in the crossbow typically when I'm walking to my stand. Um, reason being is more a safety factor. Um, because if I'm walking through thick brush or thicket and things like that, having a loaded crossbow in my hand, um, granted mine has a safety and many of, them, many of them do have mechanisms as safeties, it's like carrying a loaded gun. Um, but you know, you have brush and everything that can potentially trigger that bow. so. I typically cock it at the truck, but I don't put an arrow in it. Then as I draw closer to the, to the area where I'm going to hunt, 
depending on the time of the year, if it's pre-rut or if it's a time when the when I feel those deer might be up and moving or I might have an opportunity to shoot or if Dan sends me back to a particular swampy area and he says, you know, the deer will be moving in the cattail, so have your bow uh, ready to go. <laughs> then I might have an arrow in there. But otherwise, I carry my pack, um, my stand, my sticks, and everything on my back. I carry my crossbow in my hand, um, and I carry my cocking assist, which is just a string, with me. And typically what I do is after I get my whole setup done, so sticks up, stand up, um, I'm making my last trip down, I'll cock the bow, um, and then make my way up my set, pull my bow up, put my arrow in, and then I'm ready to go. So, most of the time, I'm not cocking or loading until I'm at the base of the stand, and I'm not loading until I'm all set up and in my stand. But other than that, I, I really don't make much adjustments. I don't think it makes me any more or less stealthy uh, with it. And there's a, to be honest, there's a lot of different variety of crossbows that are on the market. I shoot an Excalibur, and the reason why I like it is because it's a recurve, and it's simple, and there's not a lot of moving parts, and they're really resistant to the type of hunting that we do, which is walking through a lot of thick cover, walking through marshes and swamps, so I like the durability and the reliability of those, and that's why I shoot them. Um, they're not the lightest, they're, they're not the quietest, but that isn't really what I'm after. I was after accuracy and durability, and, and I like the bows. So. All right. Okay. Next question is for Dan. Uh, with your sight booming and being pulled in a lot of directions for interviews, podcasts, um, you know, on Realtree, different sponsors, etc. How do you balance all the distractions with family and friends uh, with your other priorities in life? Other priorities other than hunting? <laughs> yeah. There aren't many. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, the one that gets in the way the most is uh, my real job. <laughs> that's uh, that's a pain. But I don't I don't sleep so. Um, that probably uh, helps me have the time to do all this stuff, but uh, I just do whatever I think is most important every day as I get to it. Um, I have goals, and a lot of times I don't make those goals. Like right now, I'm working on a farm bedding video, and I got a goal to put uh, two, three hours into editing during the week, every week, and uh, half a day on the weekends, and I haven't been doing any of that. I've been having other things, family stuff come up and stuff, but uh, you just got to be able to put the stuff to the side. Um, you got to remember too that uh, my family is so used to uh, the hunting routine, it's really part of our life. And uh, my suggestion if you're having issues with that is to really uh, get your wife and your kids more involved in your hunting. Um, it really can be a family sport and uh, it's more rewarding if your family's involved. Doesn't mean they have to kill anything either. They can just be involved in other ways, um, going along on the trips, going along on the scouting, and uh, they'll take more interest in what you're doing. And uh, you know, understand what you're doing and understand your passion more if you include them. Yeah, I had some good advice. I mean, with anything, I know you listed in here things that you you know list as distractions. Um, by default, I guess human nature, we kind of think of those other things that get in the way of what we, we deem our priority or our passion is as distractions, but they're really not. Um, it's those other things you, you need to prioritize. You need to set goals, like Dan said, and and plan that stuff out. If you, if you want to spend X amount of time scouting in a month, then plan it out. Plan it out with your family. Plan it out with your kids where you're doing activities with them. Um, you're doing activities with your family. And you have that balance where you can spend time on your hunting and, and realize that there is a balance. You know, if you've got a full time job, a family, and the hunting is going to be there. Um, and you can still learn and make those things a priority and not have to spend every single waking moment obsessing over it. 
because that probably isn't healthy either. You know? Right. You know, and there's a lot of things that I'd really like to push harder. You, you know, and you just got to know your limits, and you got to know that you know this probably wouldn't be healthy. Right. You know, but I know where this guy's coming from. He's I don't know who asked it. I didn't read any of these questions in advance. We're just going on the fly here. But I'm assuming this is a younger guy than me. And uh, when I was younger, probably up until about my in my 30s, I was probably where this guy is. I, I'm reading that in the question. Maybe I'm misreading. Right. But the way I'm seeing it is, you know, when I was in my 20s to 30s, you know, I was a killer. That's all I thought about. And it was avoiding the wife to get out and go hunting. And it was sneaking around, not going home from work because knowing she has plans for me or, you know, and that was not healthy. It wasn't good for her. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for the family. But uh, on the same token, if I went back and redid it and I did it different, I probably wouldn't have the success I had. Right. So, I, I mean, I'm not telling somebody they should do that, but I'm saying, you know, there's some heavy price to pay for living that lifestyle. I mean, you're better off involving your family in what you do and and having them be part of it and not be so solo there. You know, go out and do your hunt solo or whatever if that's what you need to do and right. and, and, and be aggressive and stuff, but uh, you know, find ways to spend time with your family and still get your goals done, you know? Yeah, there's definitely a balance there and you need to find that and figure it out for yourself. Um, I think we've all been there where we've Put it first and, and wanted to make it first and you know ultimately that that takes away from other things in our lives but you got to find that balance but and if that topic. don't work when your wife goes to the bathroom run out the door get in your truck and go on <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay i'll try that one i can only say that because i know she doesn't watch these podcasts yeah yeah all right good one uh so next question so Okay, so this is kind of back to the crossbow question. I answered this one a little bit before, but it said, I'm especially interested in the crossbow stuff. How do you pack it with your stand and sticks? Um, how do you tune your broadheads? So two good questions. I, the first one I kind of covered already before. I don't do anything special to pack it in or out. Again, I carry it in my hand. My stand and my sticks goes on my back, and I carry my crossbow in my hand. Now there was one exception to that, it's always the funny story I tell where Dan, um, for, it's like the second time we actually hunted together, where he sent me out to this remote island where I had to go like a half mile or three quarters of a mile through all this thick nasty stuff. And um, that I actually went in with it in my hand and then on the way out um, I just had to navigate with my compass. <laughs> so I, I wrapped up my crossbow in my jacket. Um, bungeed it to my back with my stand and everything else because it was so thick the stuff I had to walk through and I just had you know my compass and my you wouldn't catch me back there <laughs> my compass <laughs> I have my compass and my GPS in one hand and I you know navigated out um, but I don't try to do any I know they make like backpacks where you can hook your crossbow on and other things like that can I interrupt you for a second yeah go ahead you know you you go in there with it cocked, but no arrow on it. And for me, that would drive me nuts because I'm always thinking I'm going to walk up on a deer or something. You know, I could see I'm taking the arrow off when I went through something thick, but I think I'd be ready. Yeah. You know, that's just me. I, I mean, I even knock an arrow on my bow sometimes when I'm going through an area where I know I'm in big buck traffic, you know. And I probably misstated that a little on the side of safety and caution. I mean... A couple of the areas that I hunt because I know them really well and I know the path that I'm walking to take there, I, I would put an arrow in while I'm walking in. For kind of the same reason that Dan said is that um, I know what I'm going to be encountering and going through, so there's less variables or unknown. So carrying in a loaded weapon um, isn't a big of a risk in that case. But... Um, if it's going to a new spot that's a thick spot and I'm going to be treading through a bunch of thick stuff, then I'd be more cautious with you that. You think about it, the buck I got uh, last year, I got yeah. it walking in. Yeah. I was walking to my spot when I shot it. Yeah. Hmm. And I would definitely, I know they make like crank cocking devices and depending on what you're used to, um, 
I've gotten practiced a lot and gotten very proficient at just using a regular cocking string to both cock it and uncock it. And Excalibur has some good videos out there on how to safely do that uh, with their crossbows. Uh, I'm sure other crossbow brands do as well, but that's a pretty proficient way in the field to do it. And, and the cocking string is literally, you know, a, f a few ounces of equipment that fits right in your pocket. Um, so it's not too bad. All right. <laughs> so I, this question is kind of funny, but uh, this is for Dan and Mario. Um, What's the biggest difference between the ordinary buck bedding and the cherry stuff that Dan chooses to hunt? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back and find out who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> ordinary buck bedding. Um, you know, when I look at the posts on the, on the beast, and I look at all the posts about guys that are just starting out excited about finding buck bedding, there's a little bit of me who thinks, oh, you know, they probably just found some beds and now they're all excited. But you hate to take the wind out of their sails because they're getting somewhere. They're making progress. But I walk past a lot of bedding that a lot of other people are probably hunting to get into the good stuff. And what I'm really looking for is I'm bypassing all the bedding that's just like, okay. And I'm looking for the stuff that's where it belongs. When we're pointing out those overlooked spots, when we're pointing out those little points and fingers, the tips, those big bucks are where we say they are in those videos. The rest of the deer fill the void. They're in the spots where they can't go to those big buck spots, and maybe they're young and more naive, but those big bucks will be right where they're supposed to be, and that's what I'm going to. You know, and usually you get into a big buck bed, and then, I mean, if it's truly a big buck bed and it's in a hunted area, and it's one he uses a lot, you're going to walk in there and you're going to have a, oh my God, moment. You're going to look around and go, wow, he's got the perfect spot here. This is where I would hide if I had a buck senses. And there's going to be like a, a, an amazing thing, like this is perfect, this is exactly what they talk about. He's got his back up against the tree, he's got the wind going over it, he can see everything, you can't get near him, and he's where nobody would ever guess. And that's where we're killing those big bucks. And, you know, I always talk about the, the overlook stuff, and I think people just kind of, yeah, 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 that's what he always talks about. But really, when you go back and you look at my biggest bucks, all the ones that are over five years old, almost all of them came from an overlooked spot where nobody would dream a buck would live. And when you're hunting there... It's the kind of spot you wouldn't want Mari to walk by and see you in the tree because he'd go, look at that idiot. <laughs> because, you know, half the time I'm right next to a parking lot or a road. I mean, the 400-pound slob. You could have parked where 50 cars park every day to go hunting and thrown a rock and hit him. And he was bedding there every day. I'm sitting there glassing him and I'm driving a, a station wagon with, I break for raccoons on the side of it so nobody will know what I'm doing, reading a newspaper every time they look. And I'm glassing this thing, waiting for the right wind until I moved in and killed him. He's right alongside the parking lot. And it's time after time after time again that I'm killing these big bucks like that. You take this big public marsh, 6,000 acres, and I can take a, ma a, a, a magic marker and cross out 90% of it and go, I know there's no mature bucks in this section. And that 10% that's left might be 50 acres that I have to go check out in you know, seven little different spots. And I'll go check those spots. That's all that matters. Because if there's a huge buck in there, that's where he's going to be. He's not going to be in the rest of that void. And most of the guys that are like, well, I'm finding the beds, but I'm not killing the deer. They're going out in the middle of the woods like everybody else. They're finding rubs and stuff and then some beds nearby. And that's not where the big ones are. They're off to the side. They're hidden. Think of them as if they're super intelligent. Now, we know that deer aren't, but think of them that way. And when I go into a woodlot, there's one thing I'm looking at, or a public property, is I'm thinking about, you know, where's he hiding? It's a whole, a whole different concept than other people, I think. But I go in there, and I hunt a spot. I don't see nothing. I'm like, okay, this one's down. Where could he be? And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how that buck's got some niche where nobody's seeing him, nobody's killing him. Because if he's obviously in one of these spots where everybody goes and people walk by all the time, even if it's once a week, He's going to get seen. He's going to get killed. He's got a hiding spot in there 
where nobody goes. And what you got to do is keep thinking, where does nobody go? Where aren't they? And then find the bedding areas in those spots that match the terrain features that we talk about. I mean, you can't just have an overlooked spot that's a high grass field. Right. I mean, there has to be the terrain that they need to hide them, to give them the bed, to give them the wind, to give them everything they need, but in a spot that everybody's walking right past. You know, a lot of my spots, guys are walking two miles out to the middle of this marsh, and I'm getting out of my truck waiting until nobody's looking and hunting 100 yards from my truck on the side of the road. You know, and that's where the big bucks are. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of you guys are going out and to your public spots and you're scouting and you're trying to find beds and you're trying to decipher, you know, is this a, this is a doe bed, a secondary buck bed, tertiary buck bed, or is it primary buck bedding? Dan and I, I looked up a bunch of spots, you know, we went to around central and, and northern Wisconsin and did some scouting this spring and we had, I had like six different spots that I picked out for a weekend and Dan volunteered to come and take a look at each one of these spots with me and these have been spots that I had known about and kind of had in the back of my mind that I wanted to check out and uh, I had maps of each one and, and areas that I kind of wanted to pick out and see and the difference, you know, I, I during that day, I just kind of, I took an observation of how I was thinking as I was walking through these spots and what I was looking at. And then I was trying to observe how Dan was walking through these spots. And one of the biggest differences is, is I guess the sign, the sign that Dan was noticing and the sign that I was noticing, you know, as I was walking through, I was picking up on you know, maybe every little rub that was here, every crossing trail that was coming across, maybe the main trail we were on. Um, in those same scenarios, Dan was picking up on the fact, well, there's a neighboring field right here, and I can see sign of where the hunter has hunted the border to the neighboring field. So th that, that crossing trail where that tiny little rub is, he wasn't paying attention to because it was getting pressure from the neighbor. Um, we got to a spot on one of the properties where we had to cross a stream, cross a creek, and we got to a transition where there was a hardwood transition with a parallel trail that, that ran that transition, and then it went into swamp. And again, I was focused on this parallel trail. I was looking at it for, for trails that were going into the swamp, and Dan, right away, there was two points that came off the side of of this swamp transition. He went right to the two points, looked at the sign that was on there. He didn't see any old rubs or any significant gathering places or apexes of trails there. And then he hopped right into the swamp. And did we find beds? Yeah, we found some beds, but they were all little ones. They weren't ones that looked like they were being used year after year. And this that was a bigger, you know, few hundred acre spot and what that spot we were looking at was probably an acre in size. And Dan turns around and goes, you know, I was just barely getting out there and looking at these beds. And he said, I'm ready to go on to the next spot. I've seen what I need to see. If there was anything big living here, it should we should have saw a sign in this spot that would indicate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you remember, I mean, uh, some of those spots you're looking at were quite large. And for me, I just wanted to see one or two little spots in there. Right. And if we saw a good sign, we move on. I mean, we keep scouting. But the fact that in those couple spots, the best sign we were seeing was two and a half year olds. And I'm like, let's go. And you're like, well, we barely even looked here. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but from what's in these two spots, I can tell you right now, we're wasting our time to spend a day out here. And I think most guys would have scouted that whole area, burned right. up a whole freaking day, and we were able to look at like four or five spots right. or swamps, you know. And I think the things that I learned that day, it was like, okay, if you're seeing rubs, is there generational rubs year after year that there's been mature deer there? So rubs that are higher on trees, old rubs, that means that there's bucks that are in there on a, on a basis. Uh, and are you seeing, you know, that generational sign, beds that are beat down and used year after year, and is there competition for those beds, you know? Um, and I, one spot we looked at that looked really promising that had, again, 
what looked like a one of those overlook spots. It was right backed up against the county road and the interstate, and it was a section of swamp. And we walked through some small amount of water to get there. And we actually got out there. We found a couple beds. It looked like it would be something that was really good. But then we started noticing water scarring on all the trees across the whole section of timber. And then you could see where the swamp had flooded. And we kind of came to the conclusion, or Dan brought up, he goes, you know, these animals, they might not like bedding in this spot because it fills up with water too often and it floods. Um, and you could see the water scarring from where we were standing. If it was up, we'd be standing in two or three feet of water and the bedding would be submerged. So, um, and again, that rode off. We, again, we just looked at an acre or two spot mm -hmm. and it took away a... 50 acre, 60 acre parcel. Yeah, the water scarring gave us uh, an assumption. Right. But we still went out and checked a couple islands in the cattails. Right. And we still went and checked a little little tiny pothole. And that pothole is what told me the most. Because that was overlooked. It was off to the side. It had high spots for bedding. But what it didn't have was any big buck sign. It had buck sign, but not big buck sign. And that told me, move on to the next property. Right. And it was off the beaten path from where the parking lot was, which was about a quarter clip down the road. Yeah, you had to go around a river yep. and walk up the road a quarter mile to get to this little spot off to the side. Right. And you knew nobody was doing that. Yeah, you could see where people parked in the parking lot and they hit the main trail that the DNR had and they would have walked, they would have actually walked on what would have been the west side of the river and walked into the swamp that way. So, um, yeah, good question. All right, here's one's for Dan. I would love to hear about the latest things tactics-wise that have piqued your curiosity. Whether you have confirmed suspicions or not, um, just what has your attention right now? What has my attention right now? Yeah. Hmm. It's hard to get my mind off that giant bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, what has my attention right now with deer? Uh, hmm. I don't know. Let's skip that and go back to it, unless you have anything. I mean, I don't... I know at the end of last season, just one of the properties that we hunt, just figuring out... We had hunted, you know, at, what, four or five years in a row, but it's just figuring out the pattern of how deer move through that, really mm -hmm. seeing a full picture of that, but... Um, yeah, but it's nothing new. Yeah. And we can come back to that one. Um, I like the question. I just, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. So here's another one for Dan. This one's got a lot of info here. So, where I hunt, many times my tree is in water. If I'm targeting a high spot where I think a buck is bedding, does the size of the water have an effect on evening thermals? Example, I've got one spot that has three high points that will be dry, but I'm waiting 18 to 24 inches in water to get in there. And the high spot uh, at literally 10 by, oh, it's 10 by 6 or so. So it's pretty big. That's a pretty big high spot. I would say the water is easily uh, 5 acres. Three times I've targeted this bed, and all three times the wind dies, and it seems the thermals have no rhyme or reason. I pop a milkweed and it just floats random in random directions until a breeze comes through and grabs it. Yeah. What's going on there is um, it all has to do with the water temperature. And if the water's big enough that the water stays cool, you're fine. You know, you still might have problems when it gets calm, but you're fine. What, where, where you have problems is if that shallow water um, has sun bearing down on it and it heats up. And when that sun gets down and it starts calming and that water, or the air is cool and that water's bathtub temperature, then you're going to get that, that, that thermal activity and, right. and you're going to get your scent's going to pull down. And I think, uh, well, if you're in the water, it's probably going to pull up. You'd probably be okay if it's, it's warm water and you're in the water. But if you get on an island 
or a landmass, even if it's small, you're going to drop on that landmass and pull to the water. Yeah. But uh, so you'd probably actually be better off if you're in the water if it's warm water, if it's bathtub water because it's going to pull your uh, scent up. Um, not saying that's exactly what it's doing. Uh, thermals and water are tough because they're not real predictable. Thermals on land are real predictable. But uh, I guess if you're hunting in water, if you're trees in water, I would want a hot day and I'd want that water to be hot when that sun goes down and have that thermal uprise. And it doesn't matter which way that milkweed goes if it's floating up. And I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but I've had that where you get in that warm water and you're dropping that milkweed and it's going every direction, but it's going up. And I'll watch those deer come right where that milkweed's going. As long as it's going up, and they don't smell me. Yeah. So, kind of a open answer, but... Yeah, I mean, if your thermals are pulling towards the water, depending on where you're setting up, I mean, that's... That's my hardest part with the, the water yeah. thermals, is hunting dry land next to water. Right. That's the... And, you got to put yourself on the side where the deer ain't going to get between you and that water. Right. Like I hunt a lot of points going into swamps and stuff. And if you, you put yourself, you know, in position to shoot and don't think about those thermals because you're thinking about the wind, that's where you get in trouble. When you're hunting in the water, if that water is warming and it is affected by thermals in the evening, it should be rising. You should be okay. Yeah. But if you're hunting a little island in that water, or you're hunting a point going into the water, that's where you have issues with thermals and water. Right, because it's going to pull to it. Um, I've had that happen off of the transitions, like you said, hanging out over a transition, and the wind is in my favor. Once the wind dies down, and you know it's 75, mm -hmm. 80 degrees out in early season, and all of a sudden, thermals are starting to pull my scent back out into that swamp. Yeah. You know, and that's because of the water that's sitting in there. You can get uh, differences in thermal in the same water, too. You can have water that's over from you a little deeper, and it's cooler. And the water next to you is shallower and warmer. Yeah. And you'll get a thermal effect from that, and it'll pull, drop and pull to that warmer water, because that's got that fast rise, and it's going to suck air to underneath it. Because it's that, that warmness, warmness, the warmer air rises, something's got to fill that void. And that's the cold air around it sinking. So, yeah. The good thing is, is if you do get in those spots when it gets calm, if you've got any kind of pattern to it, it'll repeat itself. Even if you don't understand why it's doing it, because it's something to do with the air and the thermals, the current. That concludes today's podcast episode. Please go to thehuntingbeast.com to post any discussions, questions, or comments regarding today's podcast episode.